All I want is a family that loves me. I don't care how they are. They could be weird, funny, different. I just want someone who cares about me and loves me. A lot of teams, like, they're just lost. We're lost. We're teenagers, so we don't know everything, even though we think we know everything. And we just want families to adopt us and love us, take us out places and things like that. When I think of hope, I think of happiness. I hope to be a peace man and do a good job. I hope to be a bodybuilder. I hope to get adopted. Hope means to me that I hope to get a good job when, I know, when I'm older. Hope to me means like faith. My hope is that I find a good family and that um, I just do good in life. We um, are ambassadors of the message of hope that we share with us everywhere we go that there's always hope. There's hope in Christ. There's hope for your future. There's this hope in renewal. There's, there's hope for a family that is in uh, disarray. There's hope for a child that doesn't have a family. There's hope. And uh, we continue to uh, shout that in every area, someone calls hope dealers, wouldn't they, Kareem? Right now, in the U.S., there is 420,000 children in foster care. 420,000 children that are displaced from what they knew or what they called home. And they're in foster care for various reasons, for... Um, for some children, it's, uh, the place that they lived is deemed as an unsafe environment. Uh, it could be physically abuse involved. It could be sexual abuse. It could be neglect uh, for a child. Or it could be a parent that's simply unable to care for them. But for whatever reason, they find themselves looking for someone to care, someone to take care of them. Many are drug-related. Um, that certainly is an epidemic right now in, in our culture. But no matter the reason, as you can imagine, it is traumatic for any child, for any person to be removed from everything they know. And while the best efforts are made to keep children with other healthy family members, um, it is still very, very traumatic. I, I spent this week, again, reinvestigating and looking and, and talking to people that have been through foster care and just asking what their story was like for them, uh, talking to my own uh, daughter, what it was like the first time that she came to our home after had been placed in a few other uh, homes. For one person, it was coming, someone came to their home and, and she was told to find a couple trash bags. They didn't have anything else and to take whatever she could find clothes wise and, and put them in a couple black trash bags. And then that individual found herself uh, in a state vehicle. They transferred over to an agency where the agency then tried to find a place for her uh, to stay. It was a, cast of, uh, a, a tough moment and um, very difficult uh, for her. If you um, are not able to find a relative uh, that can take you as a foster uh, child, um, you will be placed with in, in a house, and someone that really does care. But imagine um, it's just a house at this point. It's not a home. You're placed in a house. A home is a place of caring and nurturing and love and grace. Uh, it's our hope that it becomes a home, but until that point, it's simply a house. He or she will be with people they have never met. 
their whole lives, maybe they were told to stay away from strangers, and here they are in somebody's house, staying in someone's room on someone's bed. What a traumatic moment. And let me be clear, there is uh, no child. <laughs> there is no child that says, yep, this is where I want to stay. Every person that I've spoken with that has gone through foster care and foster parents over and over again have said, the child can come from one of the worst environments, but for them, that's just what they know. And they want to go back. And so while you might feel like you're a hero, that's the last thing that you were looked at as. Your house may be the safest place they've ever been, but they simply don't want to be there, and I guess we can't blame them. The fact is, is that no one should ever have to go through this trauma, but they do. And we all have a part to play in it. As a, as a church, we try our best to prevent it, and so we do things that like celebrate recovery, and we work with people that have hurts or habits and hang-ups, and our hope and our prayer is that maybe we can uh, encourage the parent and, and, and help fight some addictions or fight some things in their life, some habits, some hurts, some hang-ups, that maybe we can empower them again to be the parent that God made them to, to be so that their child never has to go through that tragedy. We're building a community center because we believe that it's a place for families to hang out together and to play together and encourage each other and other healthy families can be there with them and, and speak into their lives. And so it isn't, while, while I love the two slides that we've put up so far, it isn't about the slides, it's about the environment and providing a place for families to engage each other. We continue to reach our community with the hope of Christ that through him alone is salvation and purpose and meaning and value. And then when someone comes to Christ, we, we encourage them to get involved in a small group and, and so that you can be discipled and you can grow and people can speak into your lives. It's a mutual relationship. People speaking into your life and them speaking into your life all in Jesus' name. And, and so we, we do that. As a church, we do our best to provide excellent children's ministries Pastor Jennifer does a great job every weekend and during the week of trying to engage children at their age and so to encourage them and help them to understand the depth and the greatness of God's love for them. And the Pastor Whalen does a great job of trying to reach youth and trying to get them to understand that like God has a purpose for you today, not just in 10 years or 15 years, that your value is more than how many likes you have on social media, but that God loves you. Like We do our best to reach because the kids, because we know this, that like, most people come to Christ when? When they're a kid. I don't know if the statistics are, but the numbers are almost overwhelming. But even with all those in place, there are still orphaned people around us every day. Let me define the word orphan. So often we think of the word orphan as just someone that maybe lost a mom and a dad. Uh, but the whole definition of mom and dad isn't just someone that can have kids. A mom cares for, nurtures, invests in their child. A dad spends time with, encourages, uh, builds up their child. So an orphan is more than just someone that doesn't have a mom and a dad. An orphan is someone that doesn't have someone speaking into their life, someone caring for them, someone taking care of them, someone cheering them on. It could be abandonment. It could be abuse. But let's be clear. James chapter 1 uh, is pretty straightforward. James says this, that, hey, don't, don't show me, rather, don't tell me about your faith. Don't tell me how wonderful your faith is. Don't, don't tell me how much you love Jesus. Don't sing about how much you love Jesus. Like, but show me, right? Isn't that what James says? I will show you my faith by what I do, not by what I say. And then in James chapter 1, verse 27, it says this, that religion, faith that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to do what? To visit orphans and widows in their affliction, to be a part of their lives, 
Pure faith, true faith is investing and involving your life into other people's lives, especially the orphans and the widows among us. That's faith. Let me get context for you. How many know that if you're a believer in Christ, you've been adopted? How many know that you, if you will, were orphaned, that you were led in a lifestyle of sin, that within your sin you were abandoned and left out to die, that you were lost, but that Jesus came to adopt you as his child? And let's just be honest, the price was incredible. I mean, Jesus here to, to adopt us, to pay the price for adoption for us into the, into the kingdom of God was, I mean, he was misunderstood, he was abused, he was mistreated, he was falsely accused, he was ridiculed, he was mocked, he was left abandoned, he was left alone, and finally he was crucified. All so that you and I could be adopted. That just makes me think that you know, our responsibility to foster care or to adopt young people is going to look very much the same, don't you think? So what can I do? We have two speakers this morning besides me that are going to share a few thoughts. But here's a few things we can do. With 220,000 kids in the U.S. alone that are in that are in uh, foster care, 220,000 in the U.S. alone, not including those that aren't even in foster care yet. We can be a foster parent. We can help children who don't necessarily want to be helped. We can bring healing to children, and we can be part of maybe even bringing a family back together. That's the best part of foster care, I think, is you can, you can take someone's child for a moment and love on them and encourage them, but then speak into the life of their parent and pray that maybe like, they get back together. That's always the goal. Understanding it's not for everyone. Just because you have a house doesn't mean you have a home, but it will stretch you. It will stretch you in every way possible, but it'll be worth it. You could adopt. According to the Foster Network, there are 108,000 kids uh, and foster children right now waiting to be adopted in the U.S. right now. So 108,000 kids that went through foster care right now that are waiting to be adopted. In Michigan alone, there are 300, over 300 children right now in the state of Michigan waiting to be adopted. Go to mayor.org just if you want to see who they are. 20,000, 20,000 youth will age out of foster care this year. 20,000 young people. Most, when they age out, will not have a family they return to ever. Will not have a healthy place that they can call home. Just some statistics, within four years of aging out of the system, 50% of those that aged out have no earnings, and those that do make an average of income around $7,500 four years after they age out of foster care. They never found a home. Some more statistics right now, over 50% of victims in sex trafficking are from a foster care background. And just so you know, sex trafficking is huge. It isn't just out in Africa. It's right here in in America. So what I want to introduce you to a young man by the name of Isaiah. Would you go ahead and show that clip? Hi, my name is Isaiah. I am eight years old, and I'm in third grade. The three words that I, that would describe myself are kind, funny, and helpful. Some of the favorite things I like to do are go outside, play in the snow, sports, and video games. 
I'm a kid that when I get outside, it takes a long time for me to come back in. My favorite sports are dodgeball, kickball, basketball, and football. My favorite video games are Minecraft, Super Mario, Super, and Mario Kart. Yeah, especially Mario Kart 8. Oh, I love to read. I like to watch movies and stuff like horror movies, comedy movies. My favorite movie is Space Jam. One day, I want to learn how to cook. My three favorite classes are library. Oh man, that makes four, five, all of them. I like all of them. I would like a family that is active, plays with me, and plays video games with me. I'd like a, a family that, would, that has any type of animal, as long as it's a cat that doesn't scratch. I would like a family with an, old, an older sister and a younger brother. I would like both mom and dad in my for, forever family. This is the conclusion for this video. Bye. Uh, do you hear what Isaiah is asking? He's a 10-year-old boy that's saying, I want a family. It's never okay for a child to have to beg for a family. Ever. It's never okay. There should never be 300 kids in the state of Michigan putting out a video saying, would you please love me? Would you please call me your son or your daughter? That's not okay. It's not okay. Why, why are we so addicted to comfort? Why is comfort so much, such an idol for us? Why is it so hard to be uncomfortable? I don't know. Not everyone should do foster care. Not everyone can adopt. Just because you have a house doesn't mean you have a home. But I know there's homes in this house, in this room, that probably can. If I can't do foster care, if I can't adopt, what can I do? You can pray. Holy Spirit, what, what can I do? I don't feel you leading me to, to do foster care. I don't feel you leading me to adopt. So what, what can I do? The Holy Spirit's really good in instructing us, isn't he? That's all I'm asking from you today, is that you would just pray, Holy Spirit, what, what can I do? What can I do? Larry, Wendy, kiddos, because I forgot my phone again. Man, I don't know why I keep doing this, Larry. I just... Supposed to have all those kids' names memorized, and I don't even remember Larry's name half the time, even though it's my dad's name. It's the same name. Larry's going to share a little bit about his family and his experience, and then uh, Grant is going to share from DHHS. All right, so. Pastor Jason wanted to share his message with me before I spoke, and 
I regret that I didn't look at it first because I can tell you in the first service, uh, I was just trying to control my emotions from the things that he had said and the things he went over, and I really feel like I'm going to do a lot better. So here we go. My family wants me to introduce them very quickly and let them go back to their seat. Uh, although I don't mind being up front, they, they are not so big. So first of all, my wife, Wendy, uh, we've been married for 16 years on February 28th. If not for, I think, I'm pretty sure, if not for her, we wouldn't have done any of this. She's the glue that holds our family together. So, Our daughter, Lucy, is our oldest pla placement. She's now 14. She's, we've seen this young lady blossom, and it's been an amazing thing to watch. And that's all I'll say without making her go running, screaming out of the room. Peyton, our 10-year-old, is uh, our family cop and informant. <laughs> He's also my right-hand man. Peyton, or Avery, our 8-year-old, his energy level is nuclear, I always tell people, but yet so is his capacity to love. He's the backup handyman. He's, he's my shadow. He's the one that follows me around and loses all my tools. <laughs> Benji. <laughs> he's our five-year-old wonder boy. He, uh, he spent his first six months in intensive care near death and for a lot of reasons might not have been here today. He's our family pastor, aren't you, Benji? Do you want to ask them if they love Jesus, or do you want me to? All right. So Benji gives sermons at home, and part of his sermons is always, do you love Jesus? Raise your hands. Look at that, Benji. Look at him. Look at him. Look at all those hands raised. We're in a good place here, buddy. All right. Uh, Chelsea. Where's Chelsea? There she is. Our family cheerleader, choreograph choreographer, fashionista, and counselor. She can diagnose and cure sadness in a remarkable time. And then you have my boogie. All right, boogie? Baby Brianna, two years old. She's full-on happy all the time, and she will absolutely make you happy, too. She can't not make you happy. In my nervousness in the previous sermon, I forgot. Oh, and you guys want to hang out for a while, or are you good? <laughs> Go ahead, you guys. Go ahead and have a seat, Boogie. In the earlier service, I was so nervous I forgot to mention, or maybe I mentioned and I blocked it out. Uh, I actually have another child, Justin, uh, from a previous marriage who lives in Lower Michigan. He and his bride, Nicole, and their sons in Cash and Rocco make the family dynamic very interesting. Cash and Rocco have two aunts and an uncle, Benji, that are younger than them. And it makes for good conversations and strange conversations. So the number one reason I'm here is, is you, is your church. Um, I started writing down words that I associate with new life, and it's just by coincidence that they all start with C. Compassion. I, I've, I've served alongside many of you here in charitable things and, and in helping out the community because of your compassion and your compassion inspires me. Your sense of community both within your church and within your immediate area and the effects that you have on this church or on this area inspires me and many others just so you know. The challenge, the fact that your pastors challenge you and you challenge your pastors uh, is very evident and very obvious. Your charity goes hand in hand with all of that. I've seen many of you give so much. And you're Christ, you're, you're showing Christ, you're showing the love of Christ. You, you've showed it to me, you've showed it to my family, and you've showed it to so many people that I know. So why I'm here is Pastor Jason, with an incredible amount of guts, gave me an open microphone and an open forum. Uh, not many pastors would do that, I can tell you. But Pastor Jason's been a good, dear friend. We've helped each other through some very tough times for both of us. Uh, and he is a great example of pressing forward. And his pressing forward, pressing into God, also includes not allowing his church to become complacent. So I, I commend you and I commend your pastor on that. 
So my goal with my time, and, and also I should say that I like to shock pastors too, so I told Pastor Jason, I said, just give me 10 minutes, 14 minutes, I'll just pray to the Holy, you know, the Holy Ghost, and he'll give me what to say, don't worry, we'll, we'll figure it out, and I think that made him kind of nervous, and <laughs> at about 4.18 in the morning too, it made the good Lord nervous, because he woke me up and said, you need to prepare, you need to get up and make some notes, so... I will be needing note. I will be using notes because my time is short, and there is so much that I want to make sure I cover. So I apologize that I didn't have time to memorize it. But the good Lord sometimes waits till the last minute to give me inspiration. So my goal with my time is to put our God in front and center of all of this, because His entire story is just that. It's a life of it's a life of series of steps laid out perfectly by our master. As we took one step, the next step folded, unfolded in front of us, and it was an amazing thing to see. The changes we've seen in ourselves, in our children, and the parents that we've uh, been able to help out by taking care of their children while they got their life in order have inspired us. The social workers have inspired us. You'll meet Grant and, and Bonnie here in just a minute. I hope to inspire you to look for the gift Jesus promised if you would only listen to that, stalt, that small, still voice calling you to your purpose. If your purpose is in foster care, I hope that you hear from my story of the blessings that we've had and, and the life that we've lived that I can tell you I wouldn't trade for anything. Hopefully I can also have some of you understand how you can help if you're not sure how. We've printed off job descriptions at the back door. You can pick one up on your way out, please. That's my one and only joke. Please. Thank you. Some of you feel guilty that you aren't involved, even if you know that you weren't called to it. And that I don't know if I focused enough on that in the first uh, meeting or my first conversation with the first service, but... If, if you're not called to be a foster care parent, then don't have guilt that you're not to be a foster care parent and don't lead off your conversations with us, the foster care parents, by apologizing or making excuses as to why you can't be. We don't care if you aren't foster parents. We assume that you were called to something else in life. You can help foster parents. You can help the problem with foster care without being involved. But with, to, so to take away your guilt of feeling like you're not doing anything with foster care actually be able, makes us able to have much better conversations about how you can help and, and what you can do for us and what we can do for you. So a little bit of my sto more of my story now that my wife's sitting down. I'm, I'm safe to say a few more things about her without her running. My wife Wendy and I have been through some very good and some very bad times together. She's a more amazing woman than I've, I've never met. She's the exact opposite of me, which makes her a perfect partner in my walk. We started off very broke and not exactly winning in many ways, but we became very close during that time. We had dreams of a family from day one, our own children. I wanted two, she wanted three, then four, then five. That was, okay, that was the other joke. Tough crowd. No, I'm kidding. Uh, one more thing about Wendy. She is the reason I sought and found salvation. Before meeting her, I had always failed at being good, at being compassionate, at being very real. If, if not for her showing me what good was and that burning desire to know how to be good, I don't know where I'd be. Uh, so I want to make sure I point that out, that when I said none of this is possible without her, I mean literally none of this is possible. Oh, she wasn't even in the room. Hi, baby. <laughs> I'm done now. Okay, so we tried many years to get pregnant as we slowly went from a life of 90 days overdue, living in an apartment over a guy's garage, to slowly realizing our goals and living life as we went. We were the ready, set, go couple. We didn't plan things, we just went. We traveled, we golfed, we fished, we camped. We did everything that we wanted to do. And then the next part of the story, I put above it for my notes, but God. Uh, but God had a different plan. But God, rich in mercy. But God is one of my favorite 
parts of the Bible, it's where the story changes and it's where the story gets better. The one thing we couldn't accomplish was our one greatest desire, family. Too many heartaches and too many details to that journey, but many years of trying and we were beat down, to put it mildly. But that's when the steps towards foster care started to fall into place one at a time and unmistakable that we were being led to our purpose. Those steps included a dramatic change in us, a change that looking back seems so obvious now. We went from being the ready, set, go couple to just be wanting to be surrounded by kids all of the time. I can't explain that change. I can just tell you that wasn't me and that wasn't Wendy. We fostered for seven years, usually sibling groups and mostly long-term placements. We had 17 kids, of which six stuck. Thank God for that. And for a few years, every child we thought we were there and we were going to adopt were then gone. Our goal of adoption kind of got lost in the busyness of two to six kids at a time. And some were coming, some were going, doctor visits, social worker visits, counseling visits, behavior issues, all of the things that come along with this. I'm probably driving the sound guy nuts right now, ain't I? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we were changed through the Spirit. He led us to thrive on the challenge and an ability to see things through the children's eyes. That's probably the most important thing is, is as what Jason saw this week that changed him and what Jason saw this week that made him very emotional and impacted him very emotionally is he took the time to look at this through a child's eyes, to look at what the child goes through. And I can tell you when you can take the moment to do that, it changes how you see foster care forever. We didn't want to do anything else. We watched child after child transform in amazing ways right before our eyes. And at times the blessings felt like drinking from a fire hose. I can never explain it. I can only tell you that through foster care, uh, I wish I could remember the name of the missionary, but there was a missionary, a famous missionary that once said, I never felt like I sacrificed a thing. I can tell you I absolutely feel that way, and so does my wife. Our blessings have far outweighed the times that we've been crushed by this. We still have a long-term relationship. We still have a relationship with all of the children that were long-term placements in our home, and that in itself is a miracle. Some we showed a different way to live for a time, and some forever, but all by the grace of God are still in our lives today. We've also seen parents come to change their lives while we've cared for their children, and that's been some of the most inspiring moments. Whenever you feel like somebody can't change, whenever you feel like there's no hope, God shows you a way. So there has been a few heart-crushing moments, and my wife reminded me on the way here today that I don't often share those. Um, it is what it is. It's, it's part of the journey. It's part of the walk. Those crushing moments when what appeared to be forever very suddenly and very emotionally ended. I can tell you the sound of a quiet house after months of laughter, crying, and chaos was the hardest of all. However, the two times in my life that God met me there to both be strong for my wife and allow a time for him to be strong for me, two times when all I could do is fall to my knees and say, Jesus, Jesus, Two times, God met me there. Actually, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost met me there on my knees, crying for mercy from the pain. An immediate peace after a healthy lament followed by a complete surrender was the most unmistakable proof I have that God is using me for his glory and that God exists. You'd have a hard time with what we've been through trying to convince us that the good Lord doesn't have a purpose for us and that we aren't fulfilling that purpose. So on a very sad day, we closed our foster license because we were out of room. We loved that time in our life, and it was a tough day when we had to close that door. We would love to continue taking children. So you are a charitable congregation. If you would please just build us a bigger house, I promise you we will take more children. You can have the old one. I'm good. So we mentor now. We inform, we listen to the rants of and counsel foster parents and adoptive parents. We found that 
to be a way to share what we've learned along the way. I started back up the, U the UP Foster Parent Support Group recently, and we meet every first Tuesday of the month, and we're just beginning to define what that'll look like. We're only a few weeks into it. I've developed relationships with social workers like Grant and Bonnie and several others, and we, when they call on us, we're there. And when we call on them, they're there. And that's been a very good thing. We promote resources like the Foster Closet, UP Kids, the Mayor Adoption Program, the Foster Adoptive and Kinship Group, and so many others. And we will absolutely be available to answer any questions and help guide any of you in exploring your options and how you can help and answering any questions that you have about foster care. So if you have heard that voice, that what if in the middle of the night, that tugging, that nudging, but wrote it off in the morning, if you've tested the waters by asking your friends and family and allowed them to talk you out of it, I can tell you with 100% certainty that you don't know what you don't know. And you won't know until you take that first step. That first step is a giant step of faith. That first step is all that's required. Take that step. Find out if that's what you're meant to do because I can tell you with 100% certainty that when Jesus said the things you've given up for me were going to destroy you anyway, he meant that. And when he says you've never sacrificed anything because when you learn to give rather than to receive, your blessings will be manifested a hundredfold. That's a very rough... <laughs> Somebody better look that up before you guys jerk me off the stage. But it truly is. Uh, you know, when you, the other time that I truly felt God's presence was at a time when life was crazy and I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping. We had children that weren't sleeping at night. There was doctor's appointments. There was all of this going on. And I remember stopping on my way in the garage into the house one day and just realizing that I didn't remember the last time I ate. You know, I was getting three hours of sleep a night and I just stopped and I said, good Lord, I don't have time to take care of myself. I need you to take care of me. And I tell you what, he showed up, and he showed up big. I don't know when it was when I ate again, and I don't know how much slept I got, sleep I got, but I know that I didn't need it, and I wasn't concerned about it, and it was completely taken off my plate in an instant. Um, let me make sure I don't miss anything. So how can you t help if taking in a kid isn't your calling? Pastor Jason touched on it, not even touched on it, jumped on it. Go to the darkness and show them the light. It's the lack of hope that starts the chain of events that leads to us having to be foster parents. Neglect, abuse, and abandonment are the symptom of a much bigger problem of a lost and dying world. And then it turns to the behaviors that come from no hope and lead to evil the addiction, the abuse, the teenage and unplanned pregnancy, the mental health, to name a few. Go find the sick and show them how to be well. Show them grace. Change emotions or change generations of people by changing just one person and be amazed. So how do you support? Come along, first of all, the social workers and understand that they are giving their life to this. They are... They are stressed, they are overworked, they are stretched to their limits on a daily basis. Support the groups that support both the biological and the foster parents. Show these kids they matter by not sweeping all of this under the rug as soon as we get home and have lunch this afternoon. Be there for your foster parents by knowing them and knowing when they need you and when they don't. Uh, my good friends Heather and Matt were in the first service and. And they remind me that we don't, as foster parents, make it easy on you to get to know us or make it easy on you to offer help. So just do what you can and try to pry us out of that. Spend some time thinking and praying over what it would be like to be ripped from your home, as Jason said, and taken to a complete stranger with no certainty about where this leads. Consider the children who's aging out of a life of rejection and abandonment into a life of being alone and defeated. 
So how can you help fosters? You have fought meant several foster parents in your building here. Be respectful of the fact that you don't know what some of these kids have been through, so we don't need you to fix them. But we would like you to engage with them, but always being conscious and reading their body language to know that there's times when you're doing a lot more damage than you are good, so never try to force it with a foster child. The ability to know when to walk away and not try to fix something is one of the most important things you can do. Don't talk of the future with a foster child. Don't talk of the past. That's the foster parent's job. That's the social worker's job. That's the counselor job. Be in the moment. Be engaged with them. Let them know they matter. Look at them eye to eye. Ask them how they're feeling. Ask them about their day. They're not used to that, and it's that love that brings them around. Pastor Jason touched on the fact that everybody wants to go home. Every single child wants to go home, no matter how bad it is. None of my children wanted me to be their father. That's hard. It's a tough pill to swallow. But it's worth it. Okay, real helpful machine gun things to don't tell a foster. Don't tell a foster person, foster parent, why you can't. Don't tell them what you heard. Don't tell them when you will or when you plan to. Don't tell them how you wish you could. Don't tell them how you wish you did. Don't tell them how you care too much to do what they do. A gentleman corrected me earlier when I said the next two things. Don't tell, them, don't tell foster care parents how great we are and how special we are. You know what, that was wrong. Tell us, it's fine. You know, but we, I can tell you we hear it all the time. Uh, you know, and, and it, it, sometimes it makes us feel guilty that that's all we hear over and over and over again. And the other part of that is some people use that as an excuse to not do it themselves. Oh, you guys are special. God has called you to this. You know what? We were not any different than you before God equipped us to be foster parents. So if you have a feeling that you can't do it, if you have a feeling that you that you're not strong enough or you're not good enough and you somehow see us as being stronger than you, then trust me, this is not me. This is God. This had nothing to do with us. We were not foster parents before we became some. So we absolutely aren't judging you until you start a conversation with one of these. We don't want to judge people who aren't in, 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 into foster care we're just trying to get through life. We're just get, trying to get through today, and we need encouragement. We need support, and we need to be able to assume that if you aren't involved, involved in foster care, then it's because you have a different calling. Then it's because it's not your calling, and, and we can't counsel you through that. That shouldn't be our job. If you do feel guilt about not being a foster care parent, then deal with that guilt, but nobody has to justify anything to us, the foster care parents, because... That's what makes the conversation awkward. That's what makes the conversation uncomfortable. If you can talk to me about my life and I can talk to you about how you can support me and my children in the foster care network by putting that aside and not worrying about whether or not you think I'm judging whether you should be a foster care parent or not, we can be so much more effective. Remember the goal is always reunification. And that starts with grace. That starts with showing grace to these parents and, and helping them with their kids. So if there's no guilt or shame involved, then we can talk about it. And talking about it is the first step in making it better. And that's the main thing I want you to know tonight is I want to take the, or today, I want to take the awkwardness away from this so that we can have an open dialogue. And that's all I have. Thank you. Microphones. I'm going to switch microphones. There we go. Hey, Grant, I don't see you. There you are, you long hippie. Look at that hair. Make, you make me jealous. Grant, why don't you share with us what, uh, what someone may have to go through, um, go through your book there. I'm not going to read everything I have here, but my name is Grant Zims. I'm with Delta Dickinson Menominee County DHHS. My Co-worker Bonnie Harrison is here as well. The last time we, we did this, she had to get up and talk, so we decided it was my turn. Um, 
when Pastor Jason asked me to talk, he, he said, kind of focus on the need and the process of becoming a licensed foster home. And, and Bonnie and I are foster home licensing workers. I guess I want to stress this. I didn't in the first service. If, if you want to know about how to become licensed to be a foster parent, talk to Bonnie and I. If you want to know what it's, what it's like to be a foster parent, talk to foster parents. And there are plenty here. Uh, like Larry and Wendy and, and, and Pastor Jason and Pastor Monica um, and others that we've licensed through this church that they, they that's where their journey to foster parenting started. So uh, foster parents do the best job of giving a real life experience of what fostering is like more so than Bonnie and I can. So the need, when when Pastor Jason asked me to talk I decided I would keep track of all the placement requests we get from across the state. Bonnie and I, if there's other private agencies, other county DHHSs that need a home, they'll send out an email statewide, and we have to respond. So in the past, from, from Monday to last Monday to Friday at about 4 p.m., we got a total of 50 placement requests. Some of those are duplicate, but those requests represent 52 children, of those 52 kids, 27 are girls, 24 were boys. There were two less than a year old, nine from ages four to nine years old, 21 from ages 10 to 13, and 20 from ages four to 14 to 17. So um, it gives you an idea of the need, and that's where our needs are too, is for those homes for, for older children, because they tend to be the most difficult to place. Uh, when Jason and I were talking about coming to present to the church today, he said, you know, a lot of people have the heart to be foster parents. Not everyone has the DNA. And when I, in my experience, I've been doing this about uh, seven, eight years now. Uh, that heart part of it is we all care for children and want to help children out. Uh, the DNA part is, is more the process of everything you have to go through to become a foster parent. So my definition of the process, this is kind of the process that Bonnie and I use. Uh, if somebody inquires, the first step is inquiring. Call, tell us you want more information. We'll collect a little bit of information from you. Uh, but then we'll usually send an email that has video links to online videos called Foster Parenting, What Every Parent Needs to Know. And there's four videos. They total about an hour. So one hour total, not four. Um, and you watch that and you say, yeah, you know, I, maybe I am cut out for this. I want to learn more. Then we you call us back. We'll send you a welcome packet. And this is, this is what the welcome packet looks like. You get this in the mail. It's uh, probably about an inch to an inch and a half thick. It's overwhelming. There's a couple laws in there, and this is where we lose a lot of people because they look at these laws and, and everything, and they're overwhelmed. I tell people... There's a few things in there to focus on. The things that are written in layman's terms are the best things to focus on because it's going to tell you about the whole process. So once you get that and we ask you to review it and call us when you're ready for an orientation, and then we come to your home, we talk about all these things, help answer any questions you have, and at the end of that, if you want an application, we provide one. You have 30 days to complete it and return it, and then we start the investigation process, which starts with... Uh, we have you get fingerprinted to do background checks, clearances, uh, which include criminal history and history of child abuse or neglect. If you have a serious criminal history or, or any history of child abuse or neglect where you're substantiated as a perpetrator, uh, you can't get licensed, and that's some of what's explained in the welcome packet. Um, then after the clearances... Uh, we, we start the evaluation and we go through and kind of investigate you in a sense and investigate your social history, your background, your medical. If you have, we, we need to get a medical statement completed where a doctor says you don't have any physical, mental, emotional health issues that would jeopardize the welfare of any child placed in your care. Financial, just that you have enough to pay your bills and, and, and support yourselves and even a child until the payments for foster care start. Um, I'm probably missing something there, but uh, training. Training is a part of the process, too. Uh, there's so many hours required, and there's a program that we send you to. 
uh, that now it's been done online and it makes it a little bit easier because there's no travel involved or anything. Uh, but the training is important. Uh, once we get all this stuff completed and wrapped up into a package and we say, I guess our role as licensing workers too is, you know, we're helping you through the licensing process while we're evaluating whether you're appropriate, your family and your home is appropriate to be licensed. And then we ask that the process is about you assessing for yourself through that process. Hey, Kent, do I have the DNA to do this? You know, because when you go through that training, you're going to hear stories and you're going to hear things about foster children. You're going to hear things about social workers like Bonnie and I and foster care workers that you're going to say about the court that how they handle the case maybe. And, and that's kind of what I, I think of when, when Jason talks about the DNA, to put up with all the roller coaster that goes with this, with being a foster parent. And, and it is, it can be an emotional roller coaster, no doubt. So, um, so that's, as you go through the process, you do that self-assessment and if you say, you know what, I don't think I can do it, we'd rather have you withdraw your application then just press on and then place a child with you and then find out that you don't have the DNA. So, and I, I do believe in my experience that, that people are called to do it. It is a calling. So it's not doing it isn't anything you should feel guilty about. Um, I guess I'll, I'll wind things up. What, one of the things that when Jason made that comment, I thought of a, a teenage foster child that presented at one of our trainings. And he made a... I'm paraphrasing him here, but he said something in, in like, you know, a house is where, where you, you sleep and you eat and you get cleaned up and you keep your stuff. A home is where people love and accept you and are willing to stick it out and work with you when you mess up. See, that's a, you know, when you're a parent, you can't just say, well, I've had enough of this kid, time for somebody else to take him. Um, you know, when it's your own kid, when it's a foster child, you can say, you know what, I'm overwhelmed, and ask for them to be replaced. And we, that's what we try to avoid. You know, we want the first placement to be the best, and hopefully them, for them to be reunified with their parents. Uh, but but when, I, when I heard him say that, I mean, it really struck me, and I wish I could have recorded it and, and had him say it, because it's, you know, straight from the heart from this kid. And I think what I think of is God's grace in our lives, you know, uh, that's all he's looking for is grace from the people who care for him. And I know that myself included and probably most of us here have definitely experienced God's grace. And uh, we need more foster family homes that can do that. Thank you. You can go ahead and play that video. I've met some of the most amazingly resilient young people who have been through, I mean, I've been through a lot. I've experienced, you know, the death of a sibling. I have experienced not having family members there. I've experienced a lot. There are young people that I've met who have experienced, have different experiences than I've had. And the level of loss and hurt, it's, it's unreal. When people find out that I'm a a foster kid, they can say, oh, I don't know if I can do that. That's so difficult. I, I mean, what if, what if the kid goes away? Or what if I, I don't want to become too attached. I can never do that. If I could tell people one thing about foster youth, it's that they, they all deserve a family. There was a time where on paper, nobody would want me. Right, like I was a 14 year old kid who had been homeless, who was dirty and unkempt and um, had been in psychiatric hospitals, had been in juvenile detention centers, had six misdemeanors and a felony. Like nobody would have touched me with a thousand foot pole. I don't think becoming too attached is even a concept that it should be a concept. Uh, when you love, love is a risk. Love is a, a gamble, it takes a leap of faith. And could you be hurt? Absolutely, but you shouldn't choose to not love just because you're afraid of getting hurt. Any negative aspect that they bring into your home, it doesn't matter because it more than likely is the result of something far worse that happened to them and they deserve a family. If foster parents loved children like me, 
the way that Jesus loves us, then there wouldn't ever be this question of, well, I could be too attached. And thinking back on that now, like, like as a foster parent, would I even say yes? If I was presented the opportunity to work with 14-year-old Kevin and bring 14-year-old Kevin into, into my home, what, could I even say yes to myself, you know? Um, and so it gives me a unique perspective, I think, to say yes to, to kids in situations where some people might be too scared, um, to say yes and, and recognizing that um, their story is not over. Thank you for your patience today. If this is your first time with us, we are uh, 25 minutes longer than we're supposed to be. And so thank you, everyone, for being very patient and kind. Uh, and so first time guests that we usually are done by 12 at the latest, whatever it's worth. Just thought you should know that. But I want to close this in prayer. Father, thank you so much for loving us and for sending your son so that we could be adopted into your family. No greater love is there than this, that one would lay down his life for another. Um, I love the fact that you're willing to lay down your life for us. And I love the fact that you call us to lay our lives down for one another. And so that's all I pray. I just pray that you would lead us, that you would guide us. You'd help us to give the most because you gave the most. And it's an incredible confidence knowing that our rewards in heaven are greater than we can ever imagine. Whatever we think we lost, we gain it so much more. Thank you. In Jesus' name.